Max MPS Radio. My name is Jan Frisse and today I'm again joined by Steve Hall, founder and um, one of the nowadays three coaches of Revive Stronger. Um, and yeah, Steve and I did a podcast like three months ago or something and um, he introduced himself there. So I don't think you need another one. Um, but first and foremost, Steve, thank you for taking the time out of your day and being here. And yeah, I super appreciate it. No, I appreciate being on and uh, it's amazing to hear that you think, I think hopefully I'm still third in the rankings in terms of number of listens of the podcast, yeah. which is really exciting. So um, I'm glad the listeners like hearing my voice. Maybe it's just because you have more of an English audience or something. <laughs> yeah, I think just the, the, the English community is just um, bigger than the German one right now, at least probably forever. But, You're growing. Uh, what? Yeah, I'm growing. And the You're German growing. community, yeah. <laughs> I'm grown as well, but <laughs> anyways, yeah. um, just um, before we start, um, maybe you can quickly um, touch on your newest addition to the team, because I think that's like something um, really interesting and exciting. Cool, yeah, definitely. I appreciate the opportunity to. It's uh, Miguel Blacout. Um, I might pronounce his last name wrong because I like to, for some reason, pronounce it Blakut. It might be Blackout, but I'm not sure. But anyway, he is um, the new coach at Revive Stronger, and he actually approached us. Uh, we weren't particularly looking to bring on new coaches or anything. We weren't doing any applications. Um, but I spoke to him on the podcast. He came on and did a great episode going over his research on uh, protein and everything yeah. about protein. And then he came on again and joined me and Pascal for an improvement season podcast and after that he kind of was like I've got something to throw past you guys and he presented himself as an opportunity to come on the team cool. um, and we took some time to think about it we did chuck him through uh, I put him through his paces in terms of the same things that Pascal went through in terms of kind of doing um, some client programming and just make sure he got all of that right and we knew he'd pass with flying colors he absolutely did Uh, and he is an incredibly smart individual. He's going to be working towards his PhD eventually. Cool. Um, he's w worked with some of the best people in the industry, Mena Henselmans, um, Lane Norton, and he's written for the research review that Alan Aragon runs. So he, he's just an incredibly smart individual. And uh, he also comes from a family of bodybuilders. So he's very much uh, like me and Pascal in that sense. He loves the physique sports. So yeah, very excited to have him and also he gets results with clients, which is really important for yeah. me. He's already worked with quite a lot of people and got great results. And that that's important to me because there's so much, you can be like a great writer, you can be a, a really smart dude, but if you can't practice what you preach and get the client results, then it doesn't really matter. So yeah, uh, excited to have him on board. Yeah, I think you made a great choice. Um, Thank you. Cool, um, going forward, um, today's topic or that I kind of choose uh, will be periodization um, for a physique athlete. Um, and I have kind of like um, made up like a quick um, definition of periodization for a physique athlete that I will just read out loud. Um, you can add anything you want um, at the end. Cool. But I think it's just like a good um, thing to start it off um, with like a quick definition. Um, so I wrote down that um, periodization is the manipulation of training variables in a structured short um, or longer term matter for potentiated maximal results, um, reduced injury risk, and for performance sports, also the peak performance for the event day. Um, although for hypertrophy, there isn't such thing since show day involves the appearance uh, of the physique rather than performance. So yeah, that, that was my qu quick quote unquote definition. Um, do you, do you ha uh, have anything to um, add on there? For like just specific no, like to that. physique, oh. sorry, uh, specific to f physique sports. No, I like the definition. Um, it's right. Our kind of we're not necessarily peaking performance. We're peaking yeah. a look. So yeah. whilst there is that kind of need to peak, it's not in the same way, and we don't kind of taper in the same way as many other sports. So no, it's really interesting. And yeah, I like this subject. Cool. Um, going forward, um, it seems like um, at least right now that for hypertrophy, um, periodization doesn't have like a huge impact. Um, at least what we know from the current data. Um, they're all volume equated, so it isn't really like a huge surprise. Um, but I know that um, you periodize your own training and I assume uh, the, the ones of your clients as well. Um, so before I dive into um, specific um, periodization programming, I would uh, be interested if um, there's any situation where you wouldn't actually periodize programming for a client or like a, uh, a situation just. 
Cool. Yeah, no, definitely. And I do agree. Like the majority of the research is shown for hypertrophy that uh, periodization is not necessarily absolutely required or and it may not even be of a particular benefit. But I think you'd agree with me that we found it to have a real benefit to our own results and our clients' results. And talking to the people that um, like in the mass research review, I know uh, the guys there kind of talked about these subjects, but in the end concluded that they think periodization probably does play a role yeah uh, which is great to hear that they also have those concluding thoughts and a lot of smart individuals like mike israel for example he obviously has his own ways of periodizing for hypertrophy and for physique athletes so um why have i forgotten what you asked oh is there ever i, time yeah. I wouldn't periodize yeah, so wouldn't. yes um the only time i generally kind of don't periodize as such and that's more longer term periodization is for more of those novice clients yeah. so if someone is just like their first couple of years of training and they haven't really like i say training they haven't really been training they've just been kind of fumbling around in the gym they've just about learned how to do the big lifts and they just need to go in the gym and train and focus on just incrementally just going through the motions yeah because it, it needs to be the boring and basics that they need to get right initially but past that stage i think periodization especially for fatigue management is just so underrated um, so then it definitely comes into play. So for myself and for all of my clients, I periodize. I don't work with anyone who's yeah. kind of requiring no periodization. Well, maybe maybe one or two at the moment, actually. Cool. Uh, but ve very rarely do I attract that type of person. But when I was one-on-one yeah. -on -one PTing, certainly periodization just wasn't part of the program. It just didn't make any sense to even bother because I might train with them once a week and then they might go once. So it's just like just train them pretty damn hard every time I saw them. Okay, cool. Um, that was kind of the um, answer that I expected. Um, I think just like beginners or novices would just um, could should just purely focus on like technique things, um, learning the techniques, gauging uh, relative intensity, like learning how to use reps in reserve and reserve or and or RPE, and probably for a lot of people also to just train hard in general. Like if you if you put like a complete novice in the gym they don't really push themselves most of the time at least i mean they're all uh, always like um surprises but i think those are the three things i would um recommend a beginner or a novice to kind of like prioritize rather than trying to periodize your programming um to like a really specific uh, to like a really specific outcome and um yeah i think those are great points um i would go on and ask you um why do you like just from the, we now know that, um, or we know at least right now that um, periodization doesn't really have that much impact on hypertrophy in those um, current literature uh, state. So um, why do we st still think it's important to periodize um, for hypertrophy programming? So I think the research whilst is good, um, there's some holes in it and it's there's not a lot of long-term specific yeah. research towards bodybuilders. Hmm. And I very much doubt there's ever going to be that because bodybuilders and especially those who are more advanced are never really going to get, I don't know, I just can't see them giving up their complete training and they're just going to be like, yeah, just I'm just going to follow whatever you give me because they like some of them are going to know that they're going to go through like the whatever they might view it as just poor training and they just okay. don't want to leave that control. So I just don't see that study being done. Um, and if it does get done, I just can't see it being done on a large population. So I think you have to go by results that you've seen past successful coaches getting um, and results you're getting with your clients. And from what I've seen, when you look at the people who are putting out programs specifically, um, even if you look at Lar McDonald's uh, generic bulking routine, there is a form of periodization in there. He has yeah. these kind of like acclimatization weeks where he ramps up um, volumes quite low and then he ramps up and then he kind of backs off and tapers away. Um, and even within that program, and it's a generic, very basic bulking routine, um, it's got forms of periodization in there. So I think that taking in all of that into consideration, it's clear that periodization is probably something you want to incorporate. And then because we know long-term results come from staying injury-free for the most time possible, yeah. basically, and being able to train hard, it makes sense that we would want to use some forms of periodization, whether that's just deloads, whether that's using a form of kind of changing your reps and reserve or using auto-regulation, those things are all going to come into play. And I think even if there's 
bodybuilders out there who, if you ask them, do you periodize your training? And they're just like, nah, bro, I just go and train hard. I think they probably end up periodizing without knowing they are. Yeah. So they might like change an exercise. If an exercise is feeling a bit off, it's feeling a bit stale. They're just like, oh yeah, like I'm just going to switch out the, the hack squats this week and go for some sissy squats or something just because, because it's not feeling great. And that's a form of periodization in its own right. Like they're changing exercises. Maybe they've been lifting, like they just want to go and lift heavy for a period of time. They've been doing high volumes and they're just like, oh, I'm just going to go lift heavy for a period of time. I think if you look back at old school bodybuilders, they kind of go through these motions and they go through this kind of periodization scheme without even really realizing that they're doing it. And I think it plays a good point to think about just what all biological systems go through. So you go through this general adaptation syndrome, which comes from Hensal, and I just see every single form of biological thing just go through this. So you kind of create that stress, you accumulate that stress, you get that response, you get that adaption. Um, and we see this with fat loss, with sometimes you don't see the fat loss until you've kind of either given it enough time to accumulate that stress, or you have to have a diet break and you see all the water loss go and you see that adaption take place. Or you see, obviously, whether or not we need to functionally overreach or not is not completely clear. Maybe yeah. for advanced athletes, it becomes particularly beneficial. I know I've spoken to Brett Contreras, Brad Schoenfeld, and Mike Isretel, and they all kind of are like, yeah, functional overreaching, mm. they think probably has a place for hypertrophy. Uh, Eric Helms and yeah. um, uh, many others also don't think it's necessary, but there, there could be a play for it. So then you would functionally overreach, you deload, come back better, you super compensate. Um, so I think just from the fact that biological systems go through this kind of general adaptation syndrome, it makes sense that we would be better served to kind of accumulate some stress, allow that adaption, allow and then dissipate some fatigue, allow that response to come through. Um, and I've certainly seen that take place with clients and myself. And we even see it on the basis of when you get more and more advanced, you need a larger and larger stress, you need to mm. accumulate for potentially longer and longer and you don't see those adaptions until many months down the line. So you might not progress until many kind of two mesocycles in. So I just think it, it all just, there's many indications that periodization for a physique athlete, whether or not it's required, I think it might not be required, but it certainly makes sense. And I think even if it's not required, I think you will end up doing it. I think even if you're not going to plan to deload, your body will deload for you. It will taper for you eventually yeah. where you just end up either injuring yourself or you're just so fatigued you just can't keep training balls to the wall or you can't just you just even can't train hard at all or getting sick it's also something yeah yeah um yeah i really like that you integrated um the um gas principle in there so um i think just also from like a fun and preference standpoint just changing up rep ranges and kind of have something different in your training um, at least on the let's say mesocycle level is something that is really considered and um, I think injury risk as you said is something that is really like if you do the, the the same thing for super super long times eventually it will get you so um, I think I think that's really important and um, maybe we can quickly um, touch on reducing staleness through um, uh, to, to smart periodization. Um, I know we kind of don't really know why um, stagnation kind of happens. Um, like we don't really have mechanistic data behind the whole um, um, anabolic or uh, adaptive resistance. So um, how do you think um, will periodization um, like reduce staleness in the long term or why do we think that that is actually happening? Yeah, I guess, I mean, it's interesting because I, the adaptive resistance thing that you brought up where yeah. you kind of do something and you get less response from it over time, that again lays in line with that gas principle where the more advanced you get, the less you get from your training over a yeah. period of time. It's similar to like you get into a calorie surplus. Initially, you get kind of really good nutrient partitioning. You get fatter and fatter and that nutrient partitioning goes down. So there's all these adaptive resistance kind of ideas from biology that then you could put into kind of lifting and again it's drawing from mechanistic data like you said which some people don't agree with um but when you see it in line with the mechanistic data and then you see it play out in real life you kind of can yeah. see why that could like you you start drawing between the lines you're like well there's no downside for a bodybuilder 
to vary their exercises or vary their repetition range. Like there's no downside for sure, unless you're doing it too frequently. Um, you need to have some kind of ability to kind of build momentum with an exercise, build momentum with a certain intensity and kind of push forward with that. I for sure agree with yeah. that. Otherwise you're kind of getting into a zone of switching things too frequently and kind of trying to go for that confusion, which is just going to lead to no uh, muscular adaptations. You need that directed adaptation specificity yeah. over time. But at the same, in the same instance, once you've achieved that, we don't need to stick to a squat, a deadlift, a bench press. We're not a powerlifter. We have so many tools in our toolbox for exercise selection. And we know that, therefore, there's no downside to changing to a, maybe a higher repetition range or changing to a different exercise or slightly changing your grip width. Um, and there may be some upsides like the mechanistic data that we're drawing upon or the fact that just like lifting in a higher repetition range potentially produces a little bit more volume. Maybe that produces a little bit more adaptation if we're inferring that volume is one of the key drivers for hypertrophy, so long as we've got sufficient intensity and things like this. So there's that. And then sometimes it's just playing with a different repetition range. It's just easier to progress like on a percentage basis mm. to get an extra rep out on like a 10 to 15 repetition yeah. range, I feel like is a lot more manageable than getting an extra rep out in like a five to eight repetition range. That can be really hard at one point because that extra rep is such a large percentage of the total reps you're doing. So yeah. it's just that exponentially harder. Whereas in a 10 to 15 repetition range, you can progress kind of in that range quite well. And I think for some movements, like if I, for, I think most listeners will be like, yeah, if I was in a 10 to 15 rep range, I hit 12 reps and I thought I had none left. If you put a gun to my head, could I do a 13th rep? I maybe could probably squeeze one out. Whereas if it was like a five to seven repetition range, I know for myself personally, if I yeah. thought I had none left, if I go down for another squat, I ain't getting back up. Even if y'all, I'm getting shot. So <laughs> um, I think for that reason as well, um, I think change your repetition ranges can be great. And also, we don't know again, but we, Brad Schoenfeld is very much under the impression that varying the repetition range is a good idea to get full, complete hypertrophy mm. of all of the muscle fibers. And he's kind of inferred this is why bodybuilders generally might not be as strong as a powerlifter, but they're bigger because we work in that higher repetition range that powerlifters don't work within. So we're getting hypertrophy of those slower twitch muscle fibers. Um, and then you don't want to go so far with that that you don't do any fast twitch muscle fiber training because they're the biggest ones they're going to get the bulk of your training uh, that your muscle mass sorry so you want to focus on that but certainly having some higher repetition range training going in there now and then is a good idea if you periodize that or not that's up to you and mm. whether you want to do that i certainly think you can make a case for kind of working a foundation of that the kind of lower repetition range and working your way to a higher repetition range for that reasoning as well interesting um I know that there's quite some um, controversy on the slower and faster twitch muscle fibers and if you really can train them differently with different rep ranges. Um, but I think just yeah. the logical uh, rationale is there. So um, I would kind of introduce my next question, which I know is super, super broad. So maybe we can um, dive into like micro, meso and ma macro cycle level. But um, how would you then logically structure training cycles into a whole macro cycle for physique athletes and what are your rationales uh, behind each phase? Maybe we can just start with the micro cycle cool. level because I think that's, we can build it up from there. Yeah. I mean, I don't mind macro cycle. I think people have probably heard more on the micro cycle level or maybe they have more idea about how that might be planned. I think the macro cycle level isn't talked about very much. Yeah. I think a lot of people They don't have that longer term planning mindset. Um, and that's something I pride myself on. And that's something that my clients really enjoy having a long term plan. Because yeah, I definitely. think a lot of coaches might just give out like a program and then they're like, yeah, just go harder next week. And then there's no long term foresight of yeah. like where we're going from here. Whereas I like the small elements like the phase potentiation, yeah, the absolutely. sequential periodization where it builds upon each phase. Um, I don't know if we want to start. We could start off with like, I don't know, coming out of a show, that might be a place we could start. Um, yeah, actually, the my, my, my goal was to get to the macro cycle level. So I just thought okay. maybe if we dive um, into macro cycle um, at the beginning, that's, that it's kind of like confusing because people don't know how to maybe structure and periodize micro cycle level and meso cycle level, um, even though micro cycle level is probably more programming rather than periodization. Um, but 
I, I don't know. Maybe if you if you think it's uh, it's a good idea to start with the microcycle, we can also do that. Let's go with the microcycle. You know your audience, so um, cool. yeah. On a microcycle Thanks. level, um, in terms of for hypertrophy for physique athletes, I like the volume landmarks from Mike Isretel. I think they make good sense, yeah. and I think they are a tool like any other one. You can use them to kind of give you got you, yourself an idea about where you might want to go with your training. We have an understanding that there's a minimum effective volume, kind of the minimum you need to do to get a hypertrophy result. And then we have the idea that there's the most you can do. So if you start with the least you can do to get hypertrophy and then look to progressively overload from there, eventually your the maximum will hit you because you'll just build fatigue week to week if you're seeking to progressively overload. Yeah. So I like to think about where do we need to start in terms of minimum effective volume we need to set in, the minimum intensity we want to grow. So really at the moment that's looking like, I think Mike even says five reps in reserve. I feel like five reps in reserve is just yeah. no one's gonna do that. That's like super light training. So I like like four, three reps in reserve yeah. for the most part, especially on the big compound lifts. If you're on kind of the isolation lifts, I think you can go three, two reps in reserve and you can yeah. kind of eat reps out via that way. So in terms of relative intensity, that's where you wanna go. In terms of absolute intensity, it seems like you could even go as low as, tw like 20% is about as low as you can go. If you go any lower than that, it doesn't matter how hard you go, you're just not gonna really see any growth if you're a trained lifter. And I even think no one's gonna use 20%. <laughs> I think that's like, like that's a just... 60 rep max or something. It's like ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> you will that's, die. That's just something way too light. <laughs> yeah. So um, as long as you're working within for hypertrophy, like that probably six to 12 repetition range, you're focusing most of your training within that, then you're doing a great job. If you got a bit below that, a bit above that, that's cool, whether yeah. you periodize that or not, that's fine. So you've got your kind of uh, relative intensity um, and absolute intensity thresholds for hypertrophy, then you probably wanna go for frequency. As far as frequency goes, I mean, they've just recently found that even the, the bro split seems to be fine. So if you're doing once per week and you're getting sufficient volume, then you're still gonna grow. Yeah. However, I do think frequency, if you're going to be smart and you're a trained lifter, you're yeah. going to be doing at least two times per week for most muscle groups. It just becomes a legit, like logistically a nightmare if you're trying to do all of your, like, your volume in one session. I think the quality of that volume will go down, therefore your quantity will go down and you end up getting to a position where you just can't see gains that way. Um, so then your volume is a key one as well. So you need to do sufficient volume within the week to provide growth. Where that lands, it's not completely clear. I do think that 10 sets or like maybe eight to 12 to catch people at either end is probably a good starting point. I think some people might even argue less than that and that's fine. I think they'd have to make up for more intensity. Um, so maybe they're pushing higher towards failure. I just couldn't imagine starting a mesocycle with like six sets per muscle group um, and, try, and then like really low intensities. I just feel like that would just not, overloading enough yeah adherable for a lot of people yeah, yeah. and overloading and, and, enough for someone who's trained of course adherence as well people like to train hard yeah exactly sorry go exactly ahead. so no yeah so you've got this minimum threshold base these as mike would call it are like easy games it's like why would you not train here if you start off further away from here like up here then you've just missed out on this like easy progression where you can train there for weeks yeah. and see good growth. So you kind of start at this easy point and then you look to progressively overload. So whether you add the ability, if, if you've got the ability to add sets, then maybe you add some sets to muscle groups. Maybe you've got the ability to add load, add repetitions. Maybe you've got the ability for all three. I think the most important thing is you've got an idea that you need to progress things. You need to make things harder over time. The way you do it, I don't think is a massive issue. Um, yeah. Just so long you've got an idea about what you're doing. Um, I do like the set progressions, but I equally think that people who are more advanced or who are training and like the lower volume way of doing things, they can train with adding maybe more weight. Yeah. Um, but I do think for most people, they should be training further away from failure and then through the weeks going nearer towards failure. I just can't see where someone who's intermediate, they're not progressing week on week how oh, yeah. you would train at like one or two reps in reserve week one and progress each week for multiple weeks. I just can see a really early deload having to start. Definitely. So I do like relative intensity to be progressed. 
Um, so yeah, that's how I'd kind of look at things on a micro cycle level. And then you're probably after maybe four to six weeks, maybe even up to eight weeks for someone who's more novice, um, going to see a deload come in because you're start hitting a point where your performance is either stagnating or plateauing, especially if you're dieting, you're probably going to cut that back even further and you'll, you'll hit that point even sooner where you have to deload a bit sooner. And for that deload, basically we're bringing things down to maintenance. Um, where we're doing enough volume to keep everything intact, uh, which can be very, very low, yeah. especially if you're combining that with like a diet break period or eating at maintenance calories or even in a surplus, like you can get away with hardly anything. But you mostly reduce volume by up to 50%, 70 to 50%, and then intensity is coming down as well. And again, it depends, like you can change that in so many different ways, but as long as you've got an idea that volume needs to come down, so it's not overloading, you're not trying to progress in that week, you're trying to just kind of let all the fatigue come down and then reduce intensity by an amount that's appropriate for you and kind of your psychology, your kind of strength levels. If you're super damn strong, you probably want to see quite a drop. If you're really weak, you maybe not need to reduce it too much. So I guess that's kind of my basis of thinking for micro cycles for a general hypertrophy phase for a physique athlete. Yeah, um, good, really good. Um, I actually wanted to um, make a point at the, um, where you were talking about the, um, using the minimal effect of volume for your first week and also um, being kind of like further away from failure, that it's kind of like easy gains, like an easier week. Yeah. And I think that's really just kind of like an introduction week where um, I, I, I yeah. don't know, um, a lot of people who are using, um, who are not um, doing set progression, um, are using the introductory week just to get like the repeated bout effect going. Because when you do like a G load and then you jump back immediately into your, I don't know, um, average set number, you will probably end up, um, yeah, getting really fatigued in your first week. So yeah. I think that was something really interesting that I um, observed in my own training and with clients that. It's kind of like a good introductory week where you get some easy gains and then you kind of progress throughout your uh, uh, whole mesocycle. So, um, yeah. yeah, what? Go on. No, I was just gonna, I was just gonna agree um, because it's actually something I brought up with Pascal recently, who's the other coach at Revive Stronger for any of your listeners who don't know who he is. Um, who is Pascal? Because I. <laughs> <laughs> I went into my, well, he's been on the show and he's coming on again, apparently. So that's yeah. great. But yeah, I, I, it's funny going in, from my deload into my mini cut and I was going like three reps in reserve on my main lifts and particularly my squat. And it felt pretty good. And it was my first session and I was like, oh, this feels really good. Mm. And then the next week, I'm in such an aggressive calorie deficit that the fatigue had built up so much that like even holding on to performance was so hard, even though that was three reps in reserve, what was once three reps in reserve coming out of a deload fatigue free mm. and then going into a massive calorie deficit, a week of training that now felt like one rep in reserve because it, all of that fatigue had just built up. And that's what people don't realize is if you do go really hard from week one, when you're relatively fatigue free, if you are dieting, yeah. you're going to really hit the like fatigue's going to catch you eventually. And you can't even out eat fatigue like even with the best fatigue management if you go balls out from your first week in a mesocycle where do you go from there yeah definitely um i, I think a lot of people could really um benefit from um using reps and reserve like more appropriate because if you do like an one as you said like in one to two reps and reserve in the first week and then you're trying to progress as an at least intermediate trainee it's kind of hard. I mean, what are you going to what are you going to do? You, I mean, if you add load, then you are at like one to zero reps in reserve in the next week, and then the next week is kind of like, I don't know, failure or something. And I'm um, using reps in reserve appropriately. It's really like, I really just like the way of progressing throughout the cycle because it works out so great in the end. Um, like practically, I have seen so much good stuff from using that appropriately. So uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I kind of like what you said. So, um, yeah, maybe we can dive into a macro cycle level next because you kind of, I like macro cycle and then the individual mesocycles. Um, I think you covered um, the micro cycle level and how to progress throughout the mesocycle pretty well. So, yeah, we can go on further. Cool. So, yeah, if we, do we want to start from a period of coming out of a show or do you just want to start like, yeah, where should we start? Um, I mean, maybe... I don't know if we um, have the time for both, but maybe we can just 
do something like general hypertrophy phase and then maybe we can do something specific um, towards um, at the end of the show or at the beginning of the uh, macro cycle after your show. Cool. Yeah, okay. So yeah, for a general off season, kind of going through um, the different mesocycles and then making up kind of your hypertrophy macro cycle, I like the idea of kind of layering on um, things. So I like, and this is very much credit to Mike Isratel for introducing myself to this. I know you're a big fan of kind of the stuff that he's been doing with it. And it just makes Absolutely. very good logical sense. And for me, myself and my clients, it gives a long-term plan for hypertrophy that when you look at kind of what you're doing and you look at kind of the fact that volume is becoming a bigger and bigger predictor of muscular growth and yeah. we want to be kind of probably introducing more of that over time and looking less at kind of strength periodization programming methods and more so at kind of where that might lead ideas of far where hypertrophy might go. Um, this is where I've decided that I've seen the best results for people. So to actually get into it, so I like the first kind of mesocycle of that macro cycle to be more so based around the bigger compound basics. So your exercises are going to be mostly barbell lifts where you're doing your maybe your squats, your bench, your deadlifts. Um, and then looking at landing within, probably focusing within the six to 10 repetition range for the most part. Maybe you have some lifts that are above that, but I don't really like to go below six repetitions so much for hypertrophy. I just think the fatigue that that generates is not mm. worth the reward um, of the higher intensities. It just absolutely smashes most people. Um, so that's where I'd like to start at a general hypertrophy mesocycle. So sticking within that repetition range. So I do like to use undulations within there. So if you're squatting twice per week, I wouldn't just say squat six to eight reps, squat six to eight reps. I like to do like a six to eight repetition day and then like an eight to 10 repetition day, but you're keeping yeah. there or thereabouts within a range. Um, and that then opens up for future mesocycles where you might, I sometimes will go from like a six to eight and then in the next mesocycle, I'll have a down set and I'll do like one top set, maybe at that six to eight repetition range on the squat. And then I'll have a down set at 10 to 15% reduced load. And then they end up getting reps of like closer to 10 to 12. Um, and then again, the next day, if it was like an eight to 10, they do one set and then a down sets, they get closer to 10 to 12 or like 12 to 15. So there's kind of, we're introducing a higher repetition range basically within that next mesocycle. And within that, there can be some appropriate kind of maybe some introduction of new exercises. So maybe you started off with a barbell bench press. Now maybe you're doing a little bit less volume on your barbell bench press, but making up for some volume and introducing a dumbbell bench press. So then you can do a kind of higher repetition range with that, like 10 to 12. So the next mesocycle is going to be focusing on like an 8 to 12 repetition range for the most part. So you might kept a little bit of the kind of heavier weight training in there and you might have a little bit higher again and this is so you're progressing volume basically by a repetition range um, mm. and not via set numbers your set yeah. numbers probably won't change too much mm. these are things i tend to auto regulate from kind of minimum effective volumes and through the mesocycle because if exercises change if there's anything that's kind of changing within the program this all implicates things and it gets too complicated to think this is my mev this is this 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 so yeah. um, that i tend to auto regulate so I might introduce some new exercises, mesocycle to mesocycle, but I tend to keep my core movements generally the same in those first two at least. And then within the next mesocycle, when repetitions are getting into kind of a focus of more so 12, um, and then we're introducing some metabolite work, kind of the icing on the cake. And when we're thinking about this, why are these layers coming on? We're trying to like hit upon every single hypertrophy pathway so mechanical tension, metabolic stress, and um, muscle damage. Uh, so, although muscle damage is contested, yeah. of course. Um, so this final mesocycle where we're introducing this metabolic stress, which again is kind of contested a little bit, but I think there's um, some fairly decent evidence to show that this is good. BFR training and things like that is kind of good evidence for that. Where this is kind of getting the pump, getting the burn, where you're building up metabolites within the muscle groups, um, and this is a chance to chuck in like drop sets. Um, yeah, drop sets, not down sets. Drop sets, superset training, kind of high repetitions, short rest periods. Maybe you're doing muscle rounds. Maybe you're doing uh, myo reps and things like this to get the pump. And I kind of layer those on towards the end of the workout. So 
mechanical tension is the, the key drive for hypertrophy. Yeah. Everyone is on the same page for that. So yeah. that's an overgoing thing throughout the entire macro cycle of your hypertrophy training. And then I like to thread in things as we're going through and the metabolic stress, again, that's going to be happening throughout. Like you're going to get bits, especially when you're going into the, like the 12 repetition range. Yeah. But when you purposely push for that and you introduce these things in that last mesocycle to kind of have the icing of the cake and you're using kind of the kitchen sink of hypertrophy tools, that's when I like to introduce it. Because if we're thinking about adaptive resistance as well, the body's getting harder and harder and it's resisting hypertrophy more and more and more over time. So we have to chuck more and more at it. And you're almost having your hardest training within that last mesocycle where you're using all of your tools and then you probably hit a point where it's time to draw back your training volume a little bit because the body is just you, you're going to feel drained you're going to feel fatigued a deload might not do justice and that's when mm. kind of a strength mesocycle basically is a good idea where you're really bringing volume down to kind of maintenance levels you're taking some time to allow fatigue to reduce again drawing upon mechanistic data this would be like amp kinase would be coming yeah. down to allow mTOR to come back up and then you can recycle things and go through that phase again. So that would be like a three mesocycle, uh, four mesocycles. So three progressive volume increases, then the down and then going back up, which is very similar to kind of how a mesocycle microcycle structure yeah. would be where you're kind of accumulating through the weeks, then deloading and repeating. Um, I think this just works really well in terms of just structuring it for clients. It makes very good sense in terms of gaining time to kind of maintaining and then potentially throwing in some mini cuts and uh, dieting phases. And I've just found that to be each phase kind of, as we talked about phase potentiation, it, each phase kind of builds towards the next and this sequencing going on. Yeah. Um, something I would touch on is sometimes when I move from like mesocycle one to two to three, some of the exercises that you had in mesocycle one are no longer really appropriate for mesocycle three. Mm. So like a deadlift off the floor for like repetitions of 12 plus just doesn't really have a place and it fatigues you so much and you're yeah. better off picking a different variant. So that might be the time that you kind of get rid of those movements and then reintroduce them when you go through that strength phase and then build them through again. Um, so that's when you kind of, the dumbbell bench press would take over from maybe the barbell bench press in that final mid cycle. So you get some good directed adaptation, but then some exercise variation there as well. So yeah, and in a, I guess that's in a, in a short but long way how I do things. I think it misses out a lot of the details and a lot of the individualization and the caveats and things, but on a kind of broad strokes view is how I like to structure things. Yeah, um, fantastic. And um, a lot of those things are similar for me as well. Um, I would be interested in, do you always, um, have those same time frames when it comes to just um, mesocycle to um, like how much mesocycles you do before you pull the trigger with the maintenance phase or something or do you um, kind of auto regulate um, in terms of um, how many mesocycles you do before you do like a low volume maintenance phase or like low volumes so uh, yeah i tend to auto regulate it but have kind of a plan in place mm. so if i know someone's like just come out of a mini cup which has been low-ish volume, but not that low, I, they can't really go for much more than another two higher volume mesocycles, maybe two to three, and then we need to draw volume back. Whereas if someone's coming fresh out of like a maintenance phase or an extended maintenance phase, they might be able to string together up to four mesocycles of hypertrophy yeah. work before we need to do anything else. Um, and like even on an individual basis, like more novice people can get away with more and string those along yeah. together for longer. Whereas more advanced people, when they've done that kind of the metabolite work in that mesocycle, they're then just like, they're almost like, fuck this. I can't deal with any more. Like, even if you were to try and put me through another one, I'm not yeah. responding to it. I'm not, not playing ball. I need a refresh. Um, so for the most part, the three seems to work. Hmm. But yeah, it can, I guess, a range of like two up to maybe five um, hmm. can happen. I don't think, I mean, more than five, I'd be dubious of kind of seeing much more than that for anyone who's been lifting for any period of time. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's also super dependent on how your uh, period is in general and programming. But um, yeah, also talk, talking to Mike, something like two to four, um, then also um, individualized to your training age, kind of, as you said, like, if you kind of like an early intermediate, you're probably going for four um, or can go for four and like if you're really advanced um i i think mike only does like two right 
Yeah, I think I'm actually not sure what he does at the Two moment. But he was going for a he was going yeah. for a period of time where he was kind of cutting more, like losing more weight than he was gaining to try mm. and get to a, like a lean, a settling point. Yeah, I don't know if he's doing that anymore because he seems to be going pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah, um, he was he was um peak bulk when I met him in Vienna. He couldn't really eat his sushi, like <laughs> <laughs> he was just like looking at it like that mm. was kind of um kind of funny um so um yeah I, what, what i noted down is them um as you said like lower than six to ten reps for like volume or quote-unquote hypertrophy training isn't really something that you would consider um i myself have experienced that as, as well because i tried it with like a client um more towards the five to eight ish rep range in the first meso cycle and um, although it isn't like a huge change, it kind of, it is actually, it's just the intensities are just um, fatiguing you that much more and um, probably um, like five-ish reps, maybe with a squat or a deadlift, but like also just with exercises that are appropriate for it. So um, moving on, you kind of touched also, you you, um, you touched on the metabolic stress. Um, um, you, you kind of touched on that and I was actually asking you um, what importance do you think metabolic stress has in your role of maximizing hypertrophy you kind of answered that that like just mechanical tension is still the most important thing but then like metabolic stress probably has some role we aren't super sure about it but it is like um, it probably has some place where the, where the muscle damage is kind of like um, discussed more like a byproduct and um, you shouldn't really concentrate on doing like the most muscle damage you can do, but like rather just um, progressing the volumes that you are um, that are appropriate and the muscle uh, damage are kind of like a byproduct. So um, super interesting in what you just said. So um, I, ha I had actually a question of um, since you can be really creative with the um, metabolic stress or with the cycle of um, using metabolic stress intensity techniques. Um, to go to gauging more of that um what is your favorite um, intensity technique or combination of um, different things um, for maximizing torture and pain <laughs> <laughs> no yeah i mean if anything for the metabolic stress even if it's not metabolic stress thinking about it when you're doing that sort of training you're taking it pretty damn close to failure yeah. anyway you're going to be using loads more than 20% of your warm rep max. So even if it's not the metabolic stress that's causing the hypertrophy, that's still more volume. Yeah, that is not yeah. junk volume that's moving towards where you want it to go. So I don't see a problem with it. And mm. people love that style of training, at least until the end. For when one they're meso doing cycle. Like, yeah, when they're doing <laughs> six sets of a super set between two things, it gets really painful. So actually, it's funny you said for, for torture, um, because I, uh, for the first time, tried doing... It was a Smith Machine Bulgarian split squat. And I, I did my that. left leg 15 reps, then my right leg 15 reps, and then straight into Smith Machine squats. And that was torture. And I did three sets. And I actually ended up getting, in my first week, and I got an exertion headache. And mm. that basically ruled my entire, like, mesocycle throughout. And it was, if anyone was having an exertion headache, yeah. it's the worst thing ever. Um, so I learned quickly that actually... For those that for that something like that, you only need one set in your first week. And so for anyone like any advice to people who are introducing metabolite techniques, especially when you're doing superset work, um, where you're doing like a isolation movement into like a compound movement, start with like one set mm, <laughs> and then progress yeah. it. If it's like upper body, you could probably start with two, three maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, but for the lower body it, it absolutely wrecks you. agree. So that yeah. that I mean, I was barely walking after that. Um, and I can remember that day actually, I ended up I went to the gym and then left my keys at the gym. So I walked all the way home and I was like, shit, I've left my keys. And I was hobbling on the way home. And then I had to walk all the way back to the gym and then back home again. Um, and my legs were sore for like a week after that. Uh, my quads uh, was insane. So that's probably for torture and pain that that Bulgarian split squat into then a squat was just just the metabolic build up, the, the metabolites that build up your leg, the burn you get is insane. Um, upper body you can be like upper body I just I don't think anything hurts that much whereas lower body quad stuff oh that is where the pain is found or glutes I reckon I would I never do it for glutes because 
as we spoke off air, my glutes are a strong point. I don't need to do anything there. They just, they're big enough. Um, but I imagine that hurts. So if there's any female listeners, you could probably do something like um, lunges into like frog pumps. That would be, I bet that's painful. <laughs> I, I bet as well. Um, yeah, recently just coming out of my um, last mesocycle, which was the metabolic stress, more emphasized mesocycle. Oh. Um, I did like a leg press drop set. Like, um, like I did, just did my 15 to 20 normal work in the in that me mesocycle and then I did drop set at the end and I, I think at the end it was like six or seven sets or something like not six or seven drop sets but like six sets and then the drop sets at the end and it was just like man it's so, it's like a different story you, you just really couldn't walk like I was trying to 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 just go down the stairs like 10 stairs or something and it took me like one and a half minutes and I had to grab myself and it was like really bad um but also how many drop sets did you have um three three oh only yeah. three come on <laughs> yeah but it, hey man it was like what, what i did was um do you do you program more than three drop sets after the regular set so you like a triple drop set i did just um so like t how many sets so say you're doing three sets of yeah. 10 to 15 yeah. and then you're, you're doing down like 10% reps, down 10% reps, down 10% reps, and then you're done. That's your, how you did it kind of. Yeah. So I might, I might, um, I kind of added drop set every week. So if I start off with like two week one, it will build up to three, four, five. So there'd be quite a lot. Damn. Damn, but then damn. I might not add so many sets to the top yeah, sets, yeah, yeah. so that, you were that, already doing a yeah, lot Yeah, yeah, I was kind of adding, it was on my, um, actually it was on my um, more um, hamstring and posterior chain dominant day, but it was kind of like my quad work, so I added like one set per week, I think. Um, just kept the drop set at the end, but it was just like, what I did is was um, like, I'm trying to push my reps in reserve um, to really accurate levels, even with the high rep work. Uh, you kind of mentioned it, if you do like a higher rep set, it kind of hurts and you think you're two reps in reserve, but if you, if somebody would uh, put a gun on your head, you would do like three or four or something. And I really yeah. filmed myself and um, I'm really trying to push accurately um, with the reps in reserve, even with higher rep work and just like, it, it's just pain, torture. Yeah sorrow everything no i can see that yeah um cool um yeah you kind of also there would be uh, another question that i had for like the metabolic stress emphasized mesocycles how you kind of integrate that um you kind of touched on it so um yeah i don't i don't think we should dive really i mean we could we could dive really deep into programming details but i think that would just um like we would be here in like 10 hours or something so um <laughs> I could I could summarize uh, just a quick way I do it. Um yeah, if you could, if you down for that, do it. Cool. Cool. So yeah, I tend to like say it's your quad focus day. That's when I would use. I tend to put the quad metabolite work in, or mm. if it's like a vertical pulling day, that's when I put like a vertical, like more lat focused metabolite. Um, Interesting exercise within it mm. or like if it's like your chest focus day that's when i put it in like horizontal that's when i put in the chest one and maybe the vertical more vertical pushing day i put in like the tricep one so i'd only put in one metabolite technique in each session and generally it's at the end of the yeah. workout because it just drains the shit out of you mm. and then in terms of progressing it like maybe i'll add like five sets to if you're doing a giant set so five sets every week there's an additional five sets or if it's drop sets i might put an additional drop set every week or every other week depending or like the supersets an extra set every week or every other week so there's some form of progression there i yeah. don't tend to progress sets or load um it's just via like i mean reps or load is just via the number of mm. sets or actually reps if it's giant sets sorry that's cool. confusing yeah um i did you you touched on how you can really um aggregate aggregate that pain in your upper body but try like I think a giant. I did like a giant set, blood flow restriction on my biceps, and just like, oh, oh man, <laughs> it was just like somebody stabbed like a knife in my biceps at the end, and it was just like, if you push like zero reps in reserve or one or something, it, it's really bad. I need to do that for my calves because they just seem to be inc incredibly stubborn. Stubborn. I did like, 
I think my giant set for calves was like 120 in my final mesocycle. I was like, just doing nothing. <laughs> 120 reps. Yeah, yeah. My, my biceps, I think the progression went from 40 to 70 or something. So nothing too crazy, like 120 is a lot. Yeah, my calves just, I was adding like 20 reps every week. I was just like, come on, <laughs> grow. Crazy. Um, yeah, I think with me metabolic um, or with intensity techniques, you can take it really, really far. Like, um, yeah, um, kind of going forward to, um, you also touched on that, um, kind of like the lower volume phase. Um, I had a question for that. It's um, kind of relating to the um, adaptive resistance again. Um, so, I mean, my question actually was, well, uh, was like, do you think there's huge merit in lower volume phases? You already touched on that you do um and if so at what point would you pull the trigger to do one so basically i i tend to pull it once once the person is at a point where their training volume is to a point where they can't really progress it hmm. so whether they've just gone through that final phase where they've used the kitchen sink of hypertrophy tools and they can't really progress training volume from there it's kind of like, what could I do to try and eke out more? And I just couldn't, like I need to resettle things. Um, also, something to bear in mind is when you do do that really high volume phase and you're using the higher repetition range and you're using metabolite techniques, if there is that slight kind of trend, the, um, what's it called? Convergence from type one to type two, uh, mm. sorry, from fast to slow twitch, you kind of want to reset that a bit because that's getting lots of endurance characteristics and mm. you don't want that to hang around too long because that's just not what we actually want as a bodybuilder. So it's good to cycle back to the heavier loads to really let the, the fast twitch muscle fibers then come more into precedence and switch on more. Um, so I think it, it's really context dependent where it lays in, but I generally like it like at a long after a long cutting period of time, mm. like it's good to go through that lower volume phase and a maintenance period. So you kind of hold on to that lower body fat. You also allow loads of fatigue to dissipate from training because you probably escalated your training quite far. At the end of a long massing phase, unless a mini cut's appropriate where it might be, you can go for a lower volume maintenance period um, and hold on to that new heavier weight, especially if it's like a weight you've never seen before, then that's a really good idea because the body will be in a state where it's just like, if you can, if it can drop weight quickly, it will. Um, and you kind of have to fight to hold on to that heavy weight. So I think that's a good idea as well. So that's kind of where I think the, the kind of prime of the primer phase, the maintenance phase, the lower volume phase is, is a good idea. Um, once you've kind of got to a point with your training volume where it's just like, I can't progress this anymore. I've been doing high volume for a long time or after like a long diet, a long mass phase, I don't think they need to be done mm. really, really regularly. But maybe a couple of year is a good idea for a physique athlete. Yeah, I would absolutely uh, agree with that. Um, my own experience with them, um, I don't have that much experience with that. Um, to be honest, um, I think I used like I used it like three times with clients and one time with myself. It's just like every okay. time, every time they um, coming out of it, it's just like you're super fresh. Just not um, physiological, but also like psychological. You're in, um, in a mental fresh state. You want to hit the weights again and progress your training um throughout the next mesocycle so um i think they really have merit um and i think it's kind of like the deload for the macro cycle um yes and and yeah um i, th I think they're uh, they're great and people i'm um, hugely underrating um maintenance because they also they want to gain or lose fat but sometimes maintaining isn't a bad idea yeah, people, I think it's, they're really, really undervalued. Mm. Quite often when people want to go through a mini cut, it's actually a maintenance period that would set them up better than a mini cut would. Um, and they'd be better off having that maintenance going through a longer extended cut. But people and bodybuilders are kind of quite short termistic. Like to, yeah. the, the stuff we're throwing out here, the number of bodybuilders that will think that far ahead with their training, I don't think there'd be very many, but yeah. I really think there's some efficacy to it. Um, I've Absolutely. certainly found that for my clients and it sounds like you have as well john i mean i mean natural bodybuilding is such a long time they they the sport has such long time frames so i think there's definitely merit in planning out um, training over half a year or even a year or something yeah or at least have some plan in mind what you are going what you're going to do 
Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of like um, I'm going um, forward to um, the next question, which will involve mini cuts. So uh, be aware. Oh. But, um, before I actually uh, will conclude this maintenance um, phase, my maintenance my maintenance phase question. Um, I actually heard some smart people. I will not drop names, but um, maybe we can quickly touch on that after the podcast. But I heard some smart people saying that a maintenance phase is basically detraining. And then the positive effects of it are just getting back to where you were before fast through already having the uh, myonuclei and um, just experience the associated um, quote unquote memory effect. So um, maybe well, what are your thoughts on that? Just out of interest, um, also out of interest. This sounds, I, I think Mike Isretel would have some really good points on this. I think Greg Knuckles would also have some great points on this. Yeah. Um, I think, the issue I would initially see with it is that the maintenance phase is exactly as it says on the tin. It's a maintenance phase. You're not detraining anything here. You're maintaining everything you've got. You might lose some acute hypertrophy, but that's like that isn't true hypertrophy anyway. So I'm not. I don't agree with it. I don't know my nuclear domains and all of that jazz off the top of my head, but um, I've certainly. I certainly don't think it's detraining as what they're kind of stating there. Cool. Yeah, um, I think it's an, an, an interesting discussion, and um, I will probably ask that question, Mike, in like, how long is it now? Or like one month or something? Oh, what till the the conference? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about a month away. Yeah, I will definitely good give plug you, as well. Give you, yeah, <laughs> I, I was going to say I will definitely give you the opportunity to plug that as well at the end. But um, <laughs> just going forward, um. Just really quick, how 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 are we going on um, time? I think we're now like fifty five minutes on. I have like a last kind of topic question. Is that cool. okay? Or yep, cool. Um, so uh, I know from following you that you combine mini cuts with lower volumes, um, kind of like a not so effective. You touch on that as well. Um, low volume maintenance phase while also losing some body fat. And I would be interested in how do you decide if someone should do a lower volume maintenance phase, a mini cut with, with, uh, with uh, reduced volumes or a full blown cut with a slower approach and appropriate time frames and breaks? So this is a really good question because I think a lot of people are Thank like, you. I just wanna go and do a mini cut. Um, mm. Whereas that's not always the most appropriate thing for people to be doing. Um, I think mini cuts come with the caveat of you need to have already been a really good dieter. You need to have experience mm. with that, especially severe diets because it, they're severe um, and you have to be of an appropriate body fat level. So the most you're going to really lose maybe in a mini cut is maybe 5% body fat. And that'd mm. be a lot. Like that'd be a really, really a lot. And you'd have to be very, very good at what you're doing there. So if you need to lose like a good 10%, like there's no point you doing a mini cut. Um, and I'd say even if you need to lose five, 6%, you're probably better off doing a more slower extended cut um, rather than that. So for sure that comes into place. So if you need to be in a place where it's a small amount of body fat that you want to be losing and yeah. not a larger amount. Um, and then if you are looking to lose a larger amount, I think that's when a maintenance phase comes in beforehand because you are going to want to train with progressively greater volumes um, afterwards. So you'd hold that top weight for a period of time, then go through that uh, kind of lower, that longer extended cut. And that's because because it's going to be an extended cut. You aren't going to want to train with such low volumes. You are going to want to train with a higher amount of volume to secure yeah. muscle mass because yeah. of the time or the length of time you're in a deficit. Whereas a mini cut, you can get away with lower volumes for a short period of time with an aggressive deficit, so it seems. Um, so that's where I kind of decide that basis. And then whether or not still, even if it's a small amount of body fat that you need to lose, is a mini cut appropriate for you? So can you, have you been through periods of time where you've gone through an aggressive diet and seen success? Uh, have you gone through times and you've seen detriment? So have you got a kind of like, if you go through that, are you know you're gonna binge? Have you got a binge eating kind of past with you? Because okay. if you have, then maybe a mini cut isn't appropriate for you. Um, or if you know you've gone through hard diets before and been absolutely fine, you lose weight really well, then great. Um, that, that can certainly work. So you need to also have a low stress environment. So I'm really lucky in that I work from home and I can go to the gym when I want. I can eat my meals when I want pretty much. Whereas a lot of people, 
I don't know, they have families to worry about, they have jobs that they have to actually do and they have to function for um, and they can't just kind of have a nap at them in the, in the day if they need it. Not that I was doing that, but um, <laughs> this might come and they might want to. Steve's so they secret. need to have kind of <laughs> naps in the day. So um, they need to have a low stress environment and it needs to be kind of a smaller amount of body fat that they need to be mm-hmm. losing. Final kind of caveat that they want to think about when they're going through a mini cut is are you at a point where you've been training with like really high volumes for a long, long period of time? Because if you have been, then even going through a mini cut, it's not going to be long enough for you to really appreciate kind of the lower volumes. Um, Mm. You're going to want to go through a bit of maintenance beforehand, even if that's like two weeks of just a bit of maintenance, lower volumes before going through the mini cut, because you're at risk of having to train with high volumes in that mini cut to sustain the muscle mass you've got because of all the buildup of adaptive resistance from the high volumes that you've been doing. So even just like a two week buffer with a deload either side would give you so much more like ability to reduce your volumes properly during that, that mini cut. Um, it just doesn't wipe the slate clean because when we know when we're in a mini cut, we want to be using maintenance volumes for cutting, which is basically your minimum effective volume for massing. Yeah. And that is still a, a fairly amount, like decent amount of volume. And it's nowhere near as low as maintenance volumes yeah. when you're in an actual maintenance calor- calorie state. So you have to take all of those into consideration. And that's a lot of kind of potential drawing up on lots of mechanistic data. It's a lot of like, yeah. heavy scientific thinking. Mm. But I think that's appropriate when you are going, like, we work so hard to grow muscle mass and growing muscle mass is so hard whereas losing fat is easy so if we're working so hard to gain it why go through a hard aggressive diet not knowing that we're it's appropriate and we could be not lose like we could lose muscle mass we want to make sure it's the best thing for us to be doing so i think an easier approach for most people is just think right I've gained for a long period of time. I'm going to go for a bit of maintenance and then start an extended cut because that just is so much less risky. Yeah. Uh, I think Pascal had a great analogy for the mini cut in terms of like um, on a game and maybe it's Super Mario or something and people put it to like going through a mini cut is like putting it on like super hard advanced and then you go through there and you have to be on your A game to get through that level. Um, and you, if you get through it, great, you get a lot of reward, but it might just be better for you to just try the easy mode. Uh, which is just a general cut Uh, and it might take a bit longer you might not get as much reward from it in that short period of time Mm. but you might not die (laughs) and have to restart so um, that's kind of my thoughts on what's appropriate mini cut maintenance or a longer cut cool awesome Um, I like that you um, mentioned that mini cuts are for the more experienced um, dieter I may have some slight biases there for myself because like, I don't know if it's just my clientele, but they all uh, kind of re- um, respond really well on mini cuts. But they're also, um, cool. a lot of them are kind of leanish. So um, they are not too high with the, with the body fat to kind of have like an appropriate uh, mini cut and have like the results that you actually want. And they all uh, can diet really aggressive. Like if I would do like a mini cut like three, four years ago, I would probably not cannot sustain it. I mean, it, it definitely uh, takes some experience with like flexible dieting and uh, g- generally dieting in uh, whatever method you use or, um, but I think most people- And they've got a coach. Yeah. They've got def- a, a good yeah. coach to guide them through it. So that definitely, I, I've got the same with my clients. Yeah. They might, some of them might not be that advanced, but having a really knowledgeable coach mm. to guide them through it definitely helps a lot. It's like having a, a walkthrough guide to that game. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it, see, it seems kind of like mini cuts are super awesome from the outside because you see those like five weeks transformation basically where somebody goes from like, I don't know, 16% body fat to 12 and at 12 they just look so much better. So it kind of looks super awesome yeah. from the outside, but it actually um, includes some really big deficit for like five weeks. So. Um, a lot of people can take that for like a week or two, but I mean, in the end, at the mini cut, like your last two, three weeks, if you do like a five week ish, something mini cut will be. I mean, there is not, you cannot eat everything. So <laughs> there's like, if you come out of gaining, like it's kind of like, mm, I kind of have to watch my calories now. It's not like I can eat just cereals, whatever I want to. So yeah, just anyway. They're highly um, restrictive. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, cool. Steve, thank you so much again. Um, and I will give you the opportunity to plug everything you want um, away. As, Amazing. As hard as you want to. <laughs> I'm going to go so hard. Um, no, thank you so much for having me on. It's always fun uh, talking to you, Jan, because I know we we think very similarly but have different experiences, so it's nice to cool. share. Um, so, yeah, in terms of what's going on with us, I guess um, the most important thing I want to tell people is that we do have Mike Isratel and Jared Feather coming over, and uh, Jan will be there, which is awesome, so you can get an opportunity to meet him as well. Yeah, um, They're coming over on the 14th and 15th, but we only have tickets left for the 14th. So that's a full seminar at Birkbeck University, which is near Tottenham Court Road, central London. So if you can get to London on the 14th of July and you want to learn all about advanced hypertrophy, some of the things that we've talked about today, the guys are going to be talking about in super depth um, and macro cycles for physique athletes. That's definitely being touched upon. And I mean, if you want some in-depth answers to questions that you have for them, if you want to have selfies with them, this is the opportunity. And uh, these, these are always great. Mike always is, he's so fun to be around. And uh, I know I'm looking forward to meeting Jared, who I know is a really nice, humble guy. Um, so it's gonna be a great day. So if you can make it, um, please be there. It's not super expensive. And uh, yeah, it would be great to see some of the listeners there. Cool. Is there anything you want to plug? I mean, I, I will put down um, every link and stuff in the description anyway. So if you're fine with that. <laughs> I guess the only other thing would be I, if you do like Jan's podcast, then I think you'll probably enjoy ours over at Revive Stronger. We have probably. some cool roundtables. Yeah, <laughs> probably we have some cool roundtables coming out uh, in the following future. We had the Deload roundtable. We've got some more exciting ones coming out as well with Menno, Mike, and Eric Helms um, talking about many of the subjects that we've talked about here. Uh, so that's where I probably direct you. And if you do want coaching, I guess uh, Miguel does have spots. Um, and we do have coaching spots. So if you do want to kind of apply, um, that'd be great. And uh, we can help you through maybe a mini cut or something. Um, or if you ever want to kind of reach out to me directly, Instagram is a great place. I really enjoy Instagram. And so yeah. you can reach over on Instagram, Revive Stronger. And uh, yeah, we can chat there. So yeah, I appreciate that, John. Cool. Thank you. Um, Steve, I uh, wish you the best and have a great day and see you soon, man. Thank you so much.